Hello, welcome to the Judge Ben Show. My name is Ben Joseph. I'm a retired Vermont Superior Court judge. This is one in a series of uh, programs in which I interview people about issues that concern Vermont and the enforcement of its laws. Today, my guest is Doug DeSabato, who is now the uh, state's attorney for Grand Isle County. I, I want to say that uh, some time ago, when I was uh, sitting every day, I was up in uh, Grand Isle once, and in came this young court officer, Doug DeSabato. And uh, it seems almost in the blink of an eye, he became an attorney. And now he is the prosecutor for Grand Isle County and does, according to all accounts, a really very, very good job. And he's most respected in the community. Um, Doug, uh, how long have you been the Grand Isle State's Attorney? Uh, six years. Six years. Yeah. Oh my guy, Tom Star, yeah, Time flies. And you were a court officer in Grand Isle, right? Did I get uh, that right? From, yeah, from 2006 to 2012, I was the court officer for the courthouse in North Hero. Um, I passed the bar in May of 2011 and left the judiciary in uh, July of 2012 and took a job at a small firm in Burlington. And then uh, a, I was elected state's attorney in November of 2014. Time flies. It does, yeah. Time flies. Yeah. Um, well, I want to just get right into this business. You've, have you proposed that some defendants convicted of repeated DUI offenses should have their automobiles confiscated? Yes. And is there a law in the books that makes such a confiscation possible? Yeah, there is. The law went in, uh, was passed uh, when Governor Howard Dean w uh, was in office. Um, and it was sponsored by um, and supported by many legislators, some of which are still in, in the, the legislature today. Um, and it went into effect in 1999. Um, mm -hmm. And... Um, up until 2001, they had confiscated about 80, 80 some odd vehicles. Um, and I think most of that was uh, the state had hired a uh, one prosecutor to have the budget for that to actually go after um, these uh, convictions to get the vehicles uh, confiscated. And then it just went away. It went away. It, the law didn't go away, but the use of the law sort of faded out. You um, know, I, I think people aren't aware uh, I know some of the statistics, and in the four years prior to this year, 63 people were killed in Vermont in accidents where, where people have been driving under the influence of marijuana. Mm -hmm. And I think people aren't aware of that. This year, so far, there have been 10 reported such cases from the Vermont Agency of Transportation where people were driving under the influence of marijuana. Mm -hmm. And of course, the numbers for alcohol are just out of this world. Yeah, um, so as, of, as of November 10th, Yep. Of, of this year, there's been 67 fatalities on Vermont roads. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, last year in 2019, mm -hmm. there were only 37. And over a 10-year average, the 10-year average of fatalities is 53. And so there's a significant spike. And I noticed this earlier in the year. And I um, had got a... Uh, there was, I was getting several, multiple uh, DUI convictions, someone DUI 3, DUI 4, and I felt that something needs to be done. And so I issued a memo to uh, the Vermont State Police, uh, the Department of Fish and Game, and the Grand Isle County Sheriff's Department saying, I want you to get a little bit more information. I want to get the registered vehicle owner, the, the vi get everything in your affidavit, because I'm going to start utilizing these laws. And then just about a week after, we had a... a really significant um, weekend of, I think there was like five or six fatalities over that weekend. Wait, wait in Vermont or? In, in Vermont. In Vermont. And so then I decided I, I'm going to let the press know. Mm -hmm. And so I issued a press release saying that this is what's going to happen in Grand Isle County um, if you uh, are convicted of driving uh, without a license based on a prior DUI mm -hmm. um, or driving under the influence for second, third, fourth offense. Uh, the law, how the law reads, if I can... No, go ahead. The, the law reads that um, if you have a, a conviction of driving with your license suspended on the basis of a DUI conviction, mm -hmm. um, 
and you drive again and get convicted of that, another DLS, a DLS number two. Driving with license suspended, DLS? Yes, DLS right. number right. two. Right. The state can actually uh, uh, ask the judge to immobilize that vehicle. Hmm. So it gets immobilized. They don't forfeit it, but it gets immobilized for a period of time. Um, I think upwards of 18 months. Whoa. Well, where is the car then during that time? Is it in uh, the court, court parking lot? No, or? no, we would store that car. You store it? Yep, and I've talked to the sheriff in, in the county. Him and I are constant communication on all things Grand Isle County. Mm -hmm. um, so the law is, is that it can be immobilized. The same for a DUI number two, driving under the influence second time. Mm -hmm. It can be immobilized. If you get convicted of a DUI number three or a DLS number three, mm -hmm. then the state can ask that the court uh, order that it be forfeited. And um, that's what that's, I've, I've filed right now. I think I have about seven or eight petitions in the Vermont Superior Court Grand Isle unit uh, for immobilization or forfeiture. Have you ever been successful in forfeiting a vehicle for someone like under well, these circumstances? Since I just started doing this uh, several months ago, I have not had any of the cases that I've filed uh, result in a conviction yet and mm -hmm. the, mostly because the courts are are not hearing trials right now um, they're not doing a lot right now so um, but it, you know I often think of the Vermont Constitution it guarantees every citizen access to the courts mm. and I know now from from you and from other people that the delays are just they're stretching into years. People yeah. can wait years for it to get a, get a case heard. And people, you know, it, I would really encourage more members of the public mm. once the pandemic's over, but mm. to actually go to court. You know, in Grand Isle, we have court on Thursdays. Mm -hmm. And I think the public would benefit and justice would benefit if more of the members of the public were watching what's going on in the courtrooms. Um, so often, like a DLS based on a DUI, a DLS number two, mm -hmm. there's this um, t uh, tendency to just minimize the behavior. Mm -hmm. And I, I always, I always ar argue on the other side that you know this this is this is criminal behavior. This is something that's deemed criminal by the Vermont legislature. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a legislator. It's not my job to legislate. It's my job to enforce the laws and keep the public safe. And if you're driving without a license for a second or third time, there's going to be consequences. And the same with the driving under the influence, which is, I think, significantly worse mm -hmm. um, because a lot of times the, the stop, the stop of the intoxicated driver mm -hmm. is a result of um, uh, driving over the yellow line. A lot of times we get to be on the lookout. Um, Someone has called the police and said, there's this car, you know, weaving in and out of the lanes, almost hit me. This is dangerous stuff. And I know you used to refer to a case that happened in Grand Isle before my time, mm -hmm. where I think it was a result of an intoxicated driver. And I think the victim ended up dying in the flames. Actually, that was my case yeah. in front of me. And the intoxicated driver crossed the center line, hit a car killing two people, a man and his son. And it's something that's been with me, will be with me the rest of my life. I stood, I sat in court and the widow of the deceased man and the, the mother of this child stood before me with tears streaming down her face, asking me for help. And obviously there was, you know, there's precious little I could do to help her. Um, that case eventually wound up with a substantial jail sentence. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that the, um, you know, the common law, which still applies in Vermont under our Constitution, says that in sentencing someone, you're supposed to consider general deterrence, specific deterrence, rehabilitation, and punishment. Would that be State v. Corliss? Oh, well, very good. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, you passed the bar more recently than I. But I, yes, yes, that's the one. I use that case. Do you? Often, yeah. 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 And then, of course, there's a, the Vermont statute, which lays out other criteria that a judge is supposed to consider. Mm -hmm. And my point in raising this is that in the typical case, you have to consider eight to ten different factors, you know? And each case is unique to its facts. 
Yes. So it's not like you could say that DOE 1 always gets this or DOE 2 always gets that. You have to consider, among other things, the person's uh, history. Yeah. You know, what's the nature of this offense? Have they ever been convicted of it before? Well, I think that that's a great point because I know when you and I were talking earlier about certain questions to ask, I know one of the questions was like, what is a typical uh, sentence of a DUI 1? Mm -hmm. And it really, there isn't a typical sentence because... Um, it really is based on the facts of the case. Correct. You know, you might have somebody that was just speeding. When I say just speeding, they're speeding. Right. Or they might have a uh, uh, registration out of date. That's enough for an officer to pull them over. Mm -hmm. And then they see signs of intoxication, mm -hmm. um, and they process them for DUI, and maybe the number's a .08 or a mm -hmm. .09. Mm -hmm. um, they're um, compliant with the officer. They're mm -hmm. cooperative. They're not, you know, um, obstructing. And uh, for that case, you know, I would consider maybe amending it to a negligent operation um, uh, or even offering them a deferred sentence. And I'm saying that if they have no record. Mm -hmm. But there's other cases where they um, are unruly with the officer. It's a high test. They've been all over the road. Mm -hmm. um, they've endangered the life of other drivers on the road. We need something a little different. Mm -hmm. So they're really Well, you know, I think... <clears throat> I know when I looked this up before, I, was, I found that 80% of the cases in which someone is charged with DUI 1, they don't do it again. Now, of course, that's, that's a good result. That means there's been specific deterrence. And then each case is different and it may require different consequences. But in those cases where there are repeat offenses, a DUI 2, a DUI 3, I've seen DUI 5. I have a pending DUI 5 right now. A DUI 5? Yes, I do. And that's one of the cases where I filed a, a petition to forfeit the vehicle. What, what do you think the consequences of forfeiture will be? Do you think it will deter the person from driving more? Or? Well, we're taking the instrumentality away from them. Yeah, <laughs> they, but not that they can, they can get another car, yeah. but... Um, they do it again, we'll come after their car again, mm -hmm. without question. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it really does send a message. And, and often, um, the person that's driving the car is not the registered owner of the car. The car ha uh, has a lien on it. That makes no difference. Mm -hmm. they ha they have, I, have to make, I have to make them aware that I filed a petition. Mm -hmm. They have a, a right to come in and argue against the forfeiture. But I think... It's going to send a loud message um, to this people. This is the general deterrence. General deterrence, yes. And, yeah, general for people that maybe think twice about getting behind the wheel, knowing that they might not see their car again. Mm -hmm. uh, and also specific deterrence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every defendant is different. And I know I've had, um, the, you know, you, you remember certain cases, and I also remember certain cases, certain defendants. Mm -hmm. And... Sometimes you'll get somebody that is convicted of a DUI mm -hmm. or they've been charged and they're, you know, going to change their plea. And the steps that they've taken to address the behavior, mm -hmm. sometimes I see people that just minimize it and some people like take it head on. Mm -hmm. And I give those people so much credit. I've had two different instances where... Um, well, there's one in particular where a woman uh, drove under the influence and went off the road, um, and she was um, uh, she worked at a hospital and lost her job. Mm. Went to Florida for an in, you know intensive inpatient treatment for alcohol. Wow. Came back, was so remorseful. Um, we had agreed on a plea agreement. You know, she was going to plead guilty to this, and hearing her in court, I, you know, I just. I commended her. I just said, you know, I just the state needs to tell you how impressed we are mm -hmm. um, with what you've done, and I'm just I'm sure we're never going to see you again. And congratulations. And you know, you don't always get to say that to a defendant <laughs> oh, as the really? prosecutor. <laughs> yeah. Well, having been both a defense counsel and a prosecutor, I understand. <laughs> yeah. 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 So. Oh my goodness. Um. What's the longest sentence you've ever imposed, uh, you've ever gotten imposed in Grand Isle County on a DUI? Do you recall? Uh, yes, I actually do. Um, 
I know both of the, the longest sentences I've ever gotten on a case. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the one I got most recently was uh, a gentleman mm -hmm. that uh, was charged with a DUI number four. Wow. He was also charged with DUI number four refusal, and I'm not sure if the viewers understand what that is. No, but explain it to him. So after you've been convicted uh, once of a DUI, mm -hmm. the next time you have to submit to a uh, Alka sensor, mm -hmm. and if you don't, you can be charged criminally for that. It's called criminal refusal, oh. and it's a separate charge. And mm -hmm. so I charge him with the DUI number four, mm -hmm. driving over the under the influence and with three prior DUIs. Count number two, DUI number four, mm -hmm. three priors. Plus, you refused an evidentiary test where the officer had reasonable, you know, grounds to believe you were operating under the influence. Mm -hmm. um, he lied to the police mm. and said somebody else was driving, I, and. Um, and didn't have a license based on a DUI. Wow. And he would not take responsibility for that. So uh, we went to trial and a jury convicted him and he mm -hmm. got two to six years in jail. Mm -hmm. And that's on a DUI. So that was, I find, the way that the courts are imposing sentences in mm -hmm. this day and age, I felt that that was significant. Mm -hmm. um, I had asked for much more. Mm -hmm. um, I can't recall what I asked for, um, but well, I, you know, I, I, I think, well, the, uh, I go, I'll harken back to the case where the defendant killed those two people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think I, I, was, I only had that as a status conference before me. Ultimately, it was in front of another judge. And I think the sentence was 6 to 15. And I think it's very difficult to know what the outcome will be with a specific defendant. But in terms of the general deterrence argument, like the world should know that if you drive drunk and kill people, they're going to be very serious consequences. And I think there's a value in that. And it's hard to, it's hard to quantify it, but I think it's important that that should happen. Yeah. And the message needs to be sent that we're not going to tolerate this type of behavior. The public is too precious and lives are too precious and we're not going to tolerate it. And if you're going to put us to the test and want to go to trial, we're prepared to put our case on and, you know, hold offenders accountable, period. Well, that's, well, um, <laughs> well, um, yeah, what's been the reaction to your uh, proposed course of action? Uh, positive. Um, several, me well, I, I want to say numerous members of the public in Grand Isle County mm -hmm. um, have reached out to me and supported me. I've gotten notes in the mail. Oh, really? Um, just thanking me for um, taking the stand and, and treating this seriously. Um, I've received uh, correspondence from uh, several law enforcement agencies uh, in the county and outside the county, both in Franklin and Chittenden counties, um, thanking me for uh, taking this on. So I, I feel that I have this, you know, public sentiment is everything. Mm -hmm. uh, with it, you can do everything. Without it, you can can't really do much. I think that was an Abraham Lincoln quote. <laughs> and so the sentiment here is that this is what they want people to be held accountable. Mm -hmm. And we, we should feel that our roads are going to be safe mm -hmm. for us, for our loved ones. And um, I want to make do whatever I can to keep our, our roads safe. Um. I wanted to ask you about the, your position on uh, cash bail in these cases. What do you think? Should cash bail be imposed in some of these cases? That's interesting because um, this is an issue that's come up very recently. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, another uh, elected state's attorney has en enacted a policy of n directing um, uh, any deputies in that office and um, the state's attorney uh, to not request cash bail in any case. So, um, I, uh, and that, that uh, was in, in, in the news. And so uh, I wanted to make sure that people knew that we were still gonna ask for cash bail. I feel cash bail is appropriate in certain circumstances. Now, if you're talking about a, a DUI one or two, it depends on whether they have a record of non-appearances. So what people don't understand what some people don't understand, some people do, is bail is not to punish um, or to protect. It's to ensure someone's appearance in court. Um, 
and there's been bail reform even in the state of Vermont in, in 2018 our bail statutes um, were amended mm -hmm. and uh, now the judge actually has to take into consideration someone's financial status which they didn't have to before mm -hmm. and there's caps on certain uh, crimes. A lot of misdemeanors now have a $200 cap cash bail um, but uh, I don't support just eliminating cash bail altogether um, and I'll give you an example. And well, I, just I, so we're clear on this, bail is a, con a bail condition can be imposed by a judge at the person's arraignment when they first appear in court and enter a plea, right? That's correct. Okay, and they, they, the court can require, in some cases, that the person put up some money that will only be returned to them after the case is over. Mm -hmm. And they'll lose the money if they don't show up as ordered. That's right. right? That's right. Okay, and what's your experience been with cash bail? You know, I think there's misinformation um, out in the, in the um, in the public that cash bail is uh, used frequently. It is rarely used, in my experience. Mm -hmm. um, it is not something that the the courts issue lightly, and so um, if it's getting imposed, there's a reason for it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, judge, it's two hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, thousand dollars. So sometimes they only have to put up 10%, you know, so it's not what uh, I think the message that's been put to the public is a little bit skewed. Um, and I'll give you an example of, of a case I have right now um, where I have a defendant, uh, I take my glasses off to read, um, <laughs> who's 37 years old and he's got six felony convictions and 30 misdemeanor convictions. So 37 years old, six felonies, 30, 29 misdemeanors, 30 now two violations of probation, two parole violations, and eight failures to appear in court. He also had been a fugitive from justice. Um, and the state asked for and obtained a $200 um, bail. The state being you? Yes, oh, okay. and um, uh, because he failed to appear. Yeah. And the court imposed that. It was, it was a crime that was capped at $200. And the two um, hearings after that, he showed. He had to post the bail, mm -hmm. and then he um, he showed for those those um, those hearings. So this message that um, there's all these other sort of levers the court can use to to ensure people's appearance, I'm not sure what they are. Well, do you have any examples of what they might be? Or? I don't. I think there was in in one of the news interviews. Um, uh, the American Civil Liberties Union uh, was interviewed and said that um, they agree that cash bail should not be imposed. And I think the quote was that um, uh, there's enough threats from the criminal legal system that we don't need bail. And so when I heard that, I'm like, what are those threats? I'm trying to think. The only thing I can think of, Judge, is that they get a significant and severe tongue lashing from the sitting judge and say, you, you better appear next time. Um, well, if they don't, if they don't appear, can they be prosecuted for failure to appear? Uh, well, there's violations of conditions of release. Yeah. Well, that's and so if they fail to appear, yes, you can do that. But have you ever done that? Oh, yeah. And are there any consequences that flow from it? Well, I actually uh, not not significant ones, I, I would think. Mm -hmm. So. But I just, um, I feel that bail is appropriate in certain circumstances, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, I'm not sure what these other threats are that, that people are talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and I respect the ACLU. I respect any state's attorney in the state of Vermont to have these policies they want to make. I just have to do what I feel is appropriate mm -hmm. in Grand Isle County mm -hmm. and uh, to ensure that public are safe and also the justice system and the court system is respected. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when, this is, I use this saying um, when I'm asking for a certain bail and the people aren't showing, is like, you know, you give somebody a citation to appear, it's not an invitation to tea. <laughs> this, is, this is an order, you have to come to court. Um, and so, uh, that's, my, that's my position well, on bail, is there, Judge. Basically what you're saying is if people violate the court order, there should be consequences. Yes. Okay, and what are the consequences you've seen imposed? I've seen uh, stricter conditions. Mm -hmm. I've seen curfews imposed, um, but that's more for public safety. That's really not to ensure appearance. 
um, you get a condition, you must appear in court. Or well, you put under bail. the law, you can't impose one one a judge can impose conditions uh, to protect the public. They can impose conditions to protect the public. Yes, mm -hmm. but the protecting the public is different than ensuring your appearance in court. Oh, well, that's true. Yeah. But, 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 but that, can, that can be a basis for imposing a, a certain condition. Of course, of course. But in terms of ensuring their appearance outside of bail, mm -hmm. um, you can issue an unsecured appearance bond. But that, again, uh, plays into the, the uh, position of, of others that if they're going to be uh, treated differently if, they don't, if they're not wealthy. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand that argument, um, mm -hmm. but uh, I still believe that in some cases, a minority of cases, mm -hmm. cash bail I is appropriate. And it's based on the person's past behavior. Their past, they have, they've created this record. Well, 29 prior convictions, for example? Yeah, they've created yeah. this record. Um, they have a record of non-appearances. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, best, the best predictor of future behavior mm -hmm. oftentimes is past behavior. And I think that's the basis for why the legislature has, still has bail on the books. Mm -hmm. And so, um, anyway. Well, it's, it's so hard to know because, you, you, you know, each case being different, yeah. you can impose the same conditions three times and get three different results. Yes. I mean, you know, that, that's the way it is. Yeah. It's difficult. But again, bail, you know, you have someone with three failures to appear, four failures to appear. I don't usually ask for that, but you get in like six, seven, eight, nine failures to appear on your record. Think about the resources that are wasted, the time the court has set aside for that case, mm -hmm. the preparation by the state, mm -hmm. their um, most often public defender mm -hmm. that comes. It's it, the resources and the defendant just feels, eh. Well, I, 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 and I think that the example, that person's, friends and know that he's getting away with it yes that he's not coming to court so it's a lesson to them you can ignore this yeah yeah <laughs> that's really yeah that's really very difficult it is, it is difficult yes it is now in terms of the um, the delays in the court system how have they affected your work for example this business about no, i haven't been jury trials for months as i understand it is yeah. that right that is correct and i think the first one is slated to happen this month down in Wyndham County. Um, I don't know uh, which case that's going to be, um, but when was I, the last time you had a jury trial in Grand Isle County? Oh my! This um, is a, this is embarrassing. I didn't mean to embarrass you. Has it been months? I w I want to say late last year. Yeah, this pandemic started in March, so yeah. And I have cases right now that are ready for trial, um, but uh, we haven't been given the green light from the judiciary. And I, and I, I understand um, why. Well, why is because there hasn't been any resources given to the courts so that they can have sufficient personnel to do this work. Is that, is that right? Yeah, but also um, the, he the health risk that, they are, um, that, oh. they're, that they're acknowledging. So... Um, you mean the jurors have to be six feet apart and all that yeah, stuff? Yeah, so if you're drawing a jury, you're bringing in 40, 50 people mm -hmm. um, in, an, in an enclosed space. And it's very difficult to maintain social distancing in that environment, um, as well as um, the sizes of, of courthouses and courtrooms. I think it could be done. Um, well, Grandal, you have two jury boxes, right? We have two jury boxes. We have the pettit jury and the grand jury box. And I feel that we could... Um, safely and successfully um, do that if we have people sort of stay in their cars and bring certain people in one by one, mm -hmm. fill the courtroom up with, you know, um, six feet apart, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it'll be more time consuming, mm -hmm. um, but do it that way um, and uh, have a little bit of smaller pool at each time, a pool of jurors to, to choose from. Um, and as you strike them, bring more people in. And I think we could do that successfully. Uh, there's a lot of plexiglass up in, in the courthouse now. My, my table has plexiglass between the defense table. The judge has plexiglass. You know, there's a lot. So the, ju the judiciary has taken some really good steps. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel comfortable going into court. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but I'd I, I, I would really like to see the resumption of trial soon. Are there people who are in jail 
awaiting trial? Not in Grand Isle County. I can't think of anybody that are being held waiting to go to trial. So if someone's charged with a felony assault, they're, they're, out, they're not being held in jail, they're out on the street. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can think of any number of cases in which that would be very inappropriate. Yes. Um, now, again, not to alarm the public, mm -hmm. they're released under certain conditions. So when you're saying out on the street... Um, well, what are the consequences for violation of the condition? Uh, stricter conditions can be imposed. Um, uh, you, they can be released into the, the custody of a responsible adult mm -hmm. that they have to be with. They have to be um, uh, curfew. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, if they're, for instance, if they're in the Department of Corrections, mm -hmm. and when I say that, they're in their custody, not that they're in jail, mm -hmm. and they're uh, violated on furlough or have a violation of probation, um, they can put what's called a SCRAM unit or GPS unit on them. Uh, and make sure that they're where they're supposed to be. But um, in, in certain cases like violation of probation, um, and in certain cases like well, you're talking about like a significant assault, they can be held without bail. So they can be held without bail. Um, Are there people in jail from Grand Valley County who are being held without bail now? No, not that I'm aware of. And again, have, my, you, ever, have you ever made that request? Oh, yes. And what happens? I, they were held without bail. Okay, so you've had people held without bail. I have had people held without bail. It just so happens right now um, that I don't have I don't have anybody that that meets that criteria. But if someone's Actually, held there, without bail and then it takes months to get a jury trial, that person sits in jail for months mm -hmm. before they can come to court and and get their rights respected. Yeah, there is one right now that I will be asking to be held without bail who has fled the state. So oh, well, there's a reason. We'll, we'll, we will get him back and. Mm -hmm. um, and hold them without bail. Hopefully. See, uh, the thing I, I think, often think about in some of these cases where there have been crimes of violence, say domestic violence, there's a risk that there'll be a repeat if the person is, is put back on the street. Mm -hmm. And you also have, you know, victims. You know, victims are, are frightened. Uh, yes. And they're, you know, they, um, their position needs to be respected. And they have a voice. In my office, in every uh, state's attorney's office, they, we have a victim advocate, or some offices have more than one. Mm -hmm. And they're there to make sure the victim's voice is heard. Mm -hmm. they are, they're kept abreast of, of, of um, the progress of the case along the way. So, Well, the victim's rights advocates, are, do you think they're effective? Yes. Mine is. Mm -hmm. And ones I've come into contact with, absolutely. Do they have an Im impact on the conditions of release that are set? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's good. And do they stay in touch with the defendant? Uh, pardon me, with the complainant? Yes. Yep. Oh, so that, I think that kind of contact is very important. It's very important. Very important. So. And do you have adequate resources for that? Um, I do. I'd, I'd like to have a little bit more. Um, my office is, by statute, uh, I'm, I'm a part-time state's attorney. Mm -hmm. So by statute, uh, it says the, the state's attorneys from Grand Isle County and Essex County shall not serve full-time. Mm -hmm. um, and so what that means is had, if I wanted to practice privately, I could, but I devote all my time to Grand Isle County and my job as state's attorney. So um, you think in, in, in practice it really is a full-time job? Yes. Um, but they don't have to pay you on a full-time basis? Correct, by statute. Um, however, I'm like my, my admin, I have a wonderful admin assistant mm -hmm. uh, who works 32 hours a week. Mm -hmm. And I have an ad, my victim advocate works 20 hours a week. I'd like to see more hours. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have a full-time um, office mm -hmm. where our phones are answered, um, you know, as all other phones are answered throughout the state at state's attorney's offices. Um, but... Uh, so people call and leave a message, and then you have to call them back when you're free? Or? On those uh, eight hours that I don't have an admin, yes. So, or sometimes I'm in the office mm -hmm. when he's not, and I'll pick up the phone. Right now, as many people and many Vermonters, um, we're working remotely. Um, and so I, uh, I am in the office once or twice a week, and mm -hmm. so is my admin and my victim advocate, usually not at the same time. But. And how has that affected your, your job, this remote business? Uh, 
it's difficult. Um, we're making do. I actually, um, between March and um, September, uh, I wasn't going into the courthouse. I was every, doing everything remotely, and that, I was asked to do that by the judge mm -hmm. since I don't have a client like a, a public defender or a defense attorney does. But I felt that I wasn't at being as effective by appearing on the phone mm -hmm. or appearing by WebEx. Mm -hmm. So I've started going back. And so mm -hmm. I, I'm not doing anything remotely anymore. I'm, most of I'm not doing remotely, but um, if there's going to be several parties, um, they've asked me to do it remotely, and I'll, I will, you know, I'll honor that request. Do these delays tend to help the defense? Sometimes. Yeah. There, are there are witnesses who kind of disappear or don't cooperate because of long delays? Sometimes. But we, we'll make every effort we can to uh, get to those people. Um, but do some of these cases go away because you can't bring in the witnesses anymore? Because I can't bring a witness in? No. No, but, but because people don't cooperate with you. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, we're getting a little bit off course of, of DWIs and DLSs, but often is the case, Your Honor, in um, domestic violence cases where you've got a, a, a complaining witness, a victim, mm -hmm. um, who uh, recants mm -hmm. or, and stops communicating with the state's attorney's office or the victim advocate, and that could be problematic. Well, forgive me for changing the subject, but <laughs> it is my show. That's you, right. Yeah, there you go. Well, That's fine. I'm happy to talk about <laughs> it, but I just... Well, I, I'm very concerned about this stuff. You know, I... I the, the uh, consequences of domestic violence are, are, can be just horrific, particularly when it goes on for a long time, it affects the children. And it's, it's very, very difficult. It's vi my experience, uh, I've had several um, where, I had one case in particular where it was the, the gentleman had a lengthy record, mm -hmm. quite a lengthy record, mm -hmm. and I charged him with um, domestic assault. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, his attorney filed a motion to dismiss, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the um, victim uh, wasn't cooperating, uh, minimizing the behavior, actually recanting, mm -hmm. uh, and actually um, creating an alternative set of facts that were not even um, supported by the dash cam footage and audio that was captured by the officer and mm -hmm. we had a hearing and the victim is on the stand testifying and I actually had to s ask the judge to stop the hearing because I felt that she needed an attorney mm. because uh, I was worried that she was exposing herself to perjury mm. um, and uh, she was able to get an attorney uh, or the court appointed an attorney for her mm -hmm. um, but I'll, eventually the court granted the motion to dismiss mm -hmm. and uh, so it wasn't that the state dismissed it mm -hmm. but the court dismissed the domestic assault case um, and that was you know tough because well, in I, my experience that's more often happens when there are long delays so that the defendant can yeah there was some significant delays in this yeah so, so the defendant can put pressure on the complainant to withdraw her, her complaint yeah 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 well that was a couple years ago but yeah well, but, I suspect things in that regard haven't changed very much. Well, yeah. Doug, I, is there anything else you'd like to tell the world when you've got the opportunity here? <laughs> well, no, I just, I really appreciate uh, um, the invitation. Oh, um, please. I, I really appreciate it in that giving, giving me some airtime to talk about what we're doing up in Grand Isle County. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really proud of the work that I've done and my office has done over the last six years. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of the work that the uh, Grand Isle County Sheriff's Department, the Vermont State Police, and the uh, Vermont Fish and Game Wardens do up in our neck of the woods in this state. Um, and I'm really proud to support all their efforts. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, you know, my role in keeping the county safe and mm -hmm. keeping our roadways safe. Uh, responding to the needs of victims, mm -hmm. um, and also responding to the needs of defendants. Oftentimes these people uh, need resources and they need uh, mental health treatment, uh, alcohol treatment, counseling, and while I'm the prosecutor, mm -hmm. you know, my job is to make sure that justice is served. Mm -hmm. And if we can help in any way mm -hmm. um, to help those people, we'll do it. But they're all, 
we just want, we want the message to be sent that court orders need to be respected, the law needs to be respected, mm -hmm. and if you are going to commit these crimes, if you're going to be a repeat DUI offender mm -hmm. or a repeat driving uh, with your license suspended because of DUIs, mm -hmm. you're going to be held accountable. Mm -hmm. um, there will be consequences, and there's a risk that your vehicle is going to be immobilized or forfeited. So, Well, Doug, I just uh, thank you very much for coming in. You're welcome. I think thank it's you. very important that uh, people like yourself get an opportunity to speak broadly to the public. I'm going to try. Well, I'm going to get a tape of this show. And I'm going to send it to a lot of people to take, take a look to understand what you're doing. Great. Thank you. Great. Great. And uh, thank you all for looking in. This has been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.